and start. So Glenn retired as a school administrator in the early 2000s, began his second career as a historian and author. He has written quite a number of books on the history of Southwestern Ontario, including Witness to History, Tales of Southern Ontario, and Greater Evils, The War in Southwestern Ontario. Through his teaching, speaking, and writing, Glenn has inspired generations of up-and-coming historians, and I might add, uh, living history practitioners, reenactors. Uh, this fall, Glenn published his latest book, focusing on the Donnelly family, and a lot of that research is going to contribute to his talk today. So, at this point... I'm going to turn it over to Glenn. Good afternoon. Uh, just give a little background about uh, my book on the Donnellys called Blood on the Snow. My interest in the Donnellys spans decades, and I've been around for a long time. So my grandfather told me about the Donnellys because he was uh, familiar with them uh, when they lived in Appen, which was southwestern Ontario. The Donnellys ran a hotel there. Uh, Orlo Miller's book in 1962 captured my imagination, uh, as well as as did Thomas P. Kelly's book published in 1954. And uh, the removal of the tombstone, which had the word murdered on it, caught my attention even more. And then they replaced it with a new one without the word murdered in 1967. I was so interested in the Donnellys at that stage that I took a trip up to Lucan and, and Bidolf in 1965, just as I was starting to teach school, and I took pictures on the side, and some of them you're going to see today, of places that no longer exist. And I didn't realize at the time, but some of them were quite significant historically. 1966, I took my wife, Lynn. She wasn't my wife then, but I took her up for a date on the Roman line to find the spots on the Roman line that were significant. She stayed with me for over 50 years, and she's earned the title of the long-suffering Lynn Stott as a result. I've communicated with James Rennie, the professor of, his, of English in, at Western, and he wrote three plays on the Donnellys that were actually redone this, this summer at Blythe. And I began researching the Donnellys at the University of Western Ontario. I used them to teach history when I was a, a teacher at, in elementary school. I went to all the plays in the Donnellys. I wrote a, a, a book called Witness of History in 1985 that had a chapter on the Donnellys. I took field trips to the Donnelly homestead. And uh, I have a close friendship with the owners of the Donnelly house, Rob and Linda Saltz. I've uh, studied William Butt's history, PhD thesis at Western University, and it's an incredible uh, collection of records. And Ray Fazekas's Donnelly album is an excellent treasure, as is John Little's book on the Donnellys. There's two volume work that was just done in 2021. I did, I edited the diaries of William Port, the Lucan postmaster, who uh, was from 1865 to 1898. And then I in earnest started 2009 researching this. And this has been a pre, about a three to four year project, one that I hope has contributed to the lore of the Donnellys. Now, Biddulph Township was located in the Huron Tract, originally part of Huron County until about 1863. It was first settled by Blacks and was known as the Wilberforce Settlement. In 1832, Irish Protestants, mainly from Tipperary, were settled in the western part of the township. Soon afterwards, Scottish settlers were located in the eastern part of the township. And 1840 saw the beginning of settlement of Irish Catholic families from Tipperary in the central portion of the township. Road names, reflected the background of the community. The Roman line, the swamp line, were the main roads of the Catholic settlements of Bedolph. And at the south end of the Roman line was located St. Patrick's Church, Roman Catholic Church. In 1842, the James Donnelly family arrived in the township and settled on Concession 6, Lot 18. Now, Donnelly supposedly squatted on the land, but the records show that there must have been some arrangement made with the owner, John Grace. 
because it lasted over 12 years before there were any problems. Now, Donnelly and his wife, Johanna, worked hard on the farm, and Donnelly served on a coroner's jury in 1847. Johanna petitioned for the building of a school on their property as early as 1853. Now, by 1856, Johanna, or jo James Donnelly and Johanna had a family of seven boys and one girl. And unlike many of the families in the Catholic settlement, they had few relatives living in Bidolf. Other families had familial ties or by marriage ties among the community. The Donnellys had no such connections. Now, this is a Donnelly school in 1965. It had been closed in the, the summer of 64. So this is his first year as an empty school. It was a very small school then. But at one time, it was one of the largest schools in the, in the area because of the enrollment. Now, Bedolf, in, by 1850, was noted by the authorities for its ruthlessness and the crimes. Revenge for personal slights seemed to permeate the community. Authorities often feared for their personal safety when they came through the area. Taverns, inns, and shebangs were often scenes of brawls based upon politics, or revenge. Now, Bidolf in 1857 was the scene of a revenge murder involving a Protestant newcomer, Richard Brimacombe, and an Irish Catholic named Patrick Ryder. Now, Brimacombe had broken up a fight involving Ryder, who had vowed revenge. Now, Brimacombe also was threatened by Ryder's in-laws, the Caseys. And in February of 1857, uh, Brimacombe's body was found on the Roman line. He had been murdered. The suspects, Patrick Ryder and William Casey, threatened to kill the arresting constables. Then they fled and avoided arrest, hiding among their families and friends, as well as going out of the area. Now, after five years' delay, they were finally arrested. A trial was held. But few witnesses were willing to testify, and the two defendants were finally acquitted. Now, this is McElhardy's hotel. This is where one of the hearings for the trial was held in 1862. And uh, McElhardy's hotel is one of the treasures still existing in Lucan. It's uh, just on the, the eastern part of Lucan, and it still stands. It's a beautiful place. Now, in 1856, after 14 years of living on Concession 6, Lot 18, James Donnelly was ejected by the owner, John Grace. Now, 1856 corresponds with the Crimean War, and perhaps the price of grain soared so much that John Grace was tempted to renege on the deal that he made with James Donnelly because the price of grain went up, the price of land would go up, and he had nothing in writing with Donnie. Donnie was illiterate. He could not write. In fact, there's a story that told that he abhorred written work because he didn't trust it. He figured his, his handshake was as good as gold. And uh, there's a chance that John Grace was tempted by this. So as a result, he sold 50 acres of the lot 18, concession six, to a Michael Mahar, now, somehow, a new owner, Patrick, or newcomer, Patrick Farrell, entered into the issue. Now, whatever happened between Donnelly, John Grace, and Pat Farrell, the court gave James Donnelly the north half of Lot 6, or Lot 18, Concession 6. So, obviously, he had some claim to the land. Now, Donnelly was also convicted of shooting at Pat Farrell in his home and was fined one dollar and was told to keep the peace for the one year in 1856. The Donnellys were never any good at shooting. Now, in, at a B in June of 1857, Farrell and Donnelly fought each other. And in the fight, Donnelly hit Farrell with a hand spike, killing him. Now, a hand spike is about a six foot long piece of hardwood uh, used to pry logs into place. So it was quite a uh, lethal weapon. And following the Bidolf tra tradition, Donnelly fled and hid out for a year. Now he worked the fields 
dressed as his wife, because he was about the same size as his wife. And also there's tradition that there were signals, candles in the window to warn him when it was safe to come and when it was safe or dangerous to come in. And he was sheltered by several friends, but most of them were Protestants. Now he surrendered in May after a year, May of 1858, expecting some leniency, but he was not to receive it. John Don James Donnelly was sentenced to hang but Johanna obtained three petitions signed by most of the residents of the area and including some of the uh, more affluent uh, area people. And as a result, his sentence was commuted to seven years in prison. Now, this is a sketch of James Donnelly by Robert Harris. Now, Robert Harris is famous for the famous uh, the Fathers of Confederation at the Charlottetown Conference that burned in 1916 a parliamentary uh, uh, fire. and uh, But Harris was the first artist commissioned onto the, Don the Donnelly murders in 1880. And he did a number of pictures, and this is one of them. Now, Johanna Donnelly, for seven years, raised eight children and ran a 50-acre farm. She also arranged petitions to get her husband's sentence reduced, which unsuccessfully. She also arranged financial loans to keep the farm operating. And she petitioned for more property for the Donnelly School, which in 1850s had the largest enrollment in the township. In fact, at one point it had 153 students to be registered. Now, petty crimes, according to popular history, broke out in Bedolph. And the Donnelly boys were blamed for almost all of them. But these incidents were unrecorded. There's no written record of them. The one recorded incident had the Donnelly boys being charged with stealing sheepskins from a neighbor. And Johanna was also charged with receiving stolen goods. Both charges were never carried out. But the stigma still remained. Now, after seven years, James Donnelly returned from Kingston. He still had a 50-acre farm. He had a healthy family of eight children. He had a very heavy debt. And the Donnelly boys were noted for their work ethic, their intelligence, their flamboyance, and their fashion sense. They were popular among some and not so popular among others. It, over the time, from 1865 to 1873, the Donnellys worked on their farm. Then in 1873, the Donnellys started up a stage line running from Exeter to London through Lucan. They were at times at least two competition lines. And there were incidents of vandalism, racing, brawls, arson, and slaughter of horses among the competitors. Court cases abounded between the Donnellys and the opposition lines. And Lucan became the focal center of the stage problems. And often each night there would be brawls associated with the stages. The Donnelly boys lived in Lucan and were around each and every night. Drinking led to other issues such as robbery, bad language, assault. And frequently the Donnellys were charged, often fined, but also often acquitted. Lucanites formed strong opinions about the family and the stage business. Soon, Lucan and the stage feuds became known for the reign of terror, where fires were frequent, as were other crimes, and the Donnelly boys were front and center, and there's no question the Donnellys were responsible for many of those crimes and fires. The Lucan merchants had reached a point of frustration from the outbreak of the crimes, and led by a stage owner, Patrick Flanagan, hired one Hugh McKinnon, a private detective living out of Hamilton, and he was to work up cases against the Donnellys in 1876. Now, the Lucan merchants formed a vigilance committee or vigilante committee under McKinnon's leadership, and they captured and tortured a friend of the Donnellys and hanged him from a tree five different times in that same time, trying to get information against the family. They failed. And in all, after McKinnon's investigations, 
he laid a total of 13 charges against the Donnellys. And the, the Assizes of 1876 became known as the Donnelly Assizes. They were convicted of three of the 13 charges. The rest, they were acquitted. And three of the Donnellys were sentenced to three to nine month sentenced. Now, at the end of his nine month sentence, James Donnelly Jr. died in May of 1877 after his return from prison. Feelings against the Donnellys and for the Donnellys in Lucan were very, very intense. An attack on the Donnellys at this time might have been expected or understood. But by 1878, the stage business had died because of the railways. February of 1878, the Donnelly stage stopped. There was no more Donnelly stages. Some of the Donnelly boys married and moved away. There was noticeably fewer crimes, but nevertheless, the Donnellys, although there were fewer of them, were still being blamed. Between 1874 and 1878, the Donnellys were involved in Lucan. There was no question about it. They were active against the other stage lines. The arson, the assaults, the robberies, the animal slaughter, the vandalism, all part and parcel of the feud. And the Donnellys bore, had to bear some responsibility for them. But there were other groups too. The Lucan merchants, when they formed the vigilante committee, tried to get something on the Donnellys, but they failed. And McKinnon tried to get the Donnellys convicted and put away from prison for a long time. He failed as well. But as I said, the attack on the Donnellys at that time would have been expected, but it didn't happen. And 1878-79 represented a lull in the crimes in and around Vidolf and Lucan. In fact, few of the Donnellys were involved. And by 1878, one had died, Mike or James Jr., Two had moved away, Michael and Pat. One later was killed in uh, Waterford, that would be Michael. And the other was living in Niagara. <clears throat> and Bob Donnelly was in prison for two years and did not, and uh, for shooting at uh, Sam Everett, a constable. And he did not return in January 1880. However, there were two things which during this period might have caused what was to follow. Firstly, James Carroll was born and raised in nearby Stephen Township, and he returned from the United States in 1878, where he had worked as a foreman on the railway. And in, as a foreman on the railway, he led some pretty rough characters and uh, did it very successfully. Carroll had been left out of his father's will when he died in the 1870s and had left town. But he came back hoping that he could reclaim his father's farm. And uh, But unfortunately, his uncles did not trust him and refused to allow him. So he moved in with a, another uncle, James Mahar, in Bedolf and lived with him. And Carol somehow developed an intense dislike for the Donnellys, probably influenced by James Mahar. Now, Mahar was also connected to the Kane family, to the Casey family, to the Ryder family. So there's all kinds of indirect relationships. So Carol was also connected to them as well. Now, in January of 1879, Father John Conley was appointed by Bishop Walsh to bring order to the Catholic settlement. Now, he felt, Conley felt strongly that crime was on the increase. And much of the blame, from statements of his parishioners, laid it against the Donnellys, even though there were fewer crimes in Badolf, and none of them had involved the Donnellys in 1878, 79. Now, in 1879, Father Conley formed a Bedolf Peace Society, which soon became an anti Donnelly organization. This is a copy of the copy book that he put at the back of the church on June 15, 1879. And he asked all his parishioners that they would support a uh, uh, basically a property protective association by signing this you were saying that I will allow anyone to come on my property and search for stolen property. Now, the one family that noticeably did not sign were the Donnellys. And it was on the, the suggestion of Will Donnelly. James Donnelly was going to sign it, 
But Will Donnie, his son, told him, don't sign it because the, 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 your enemies are going to start planting things on your property and you're going to be charged with it. So as a result, the uh, Peace Society became an anti donnie organization. And Father Conley, although he never would admit that he used the name Donnelly in his sermons, made several verbal attacks against a family in the community. Now, most of the people in the parishioners in the Catholic Church at that time assumed that he was referring to the Donnellys. But he also supposedly called William Donnelly a cripple and a devil. Now, William Donnelly had a club foot and was obviously physically challenged. But also, William Donnelly was an incredibly intelligent and very outspoken person. And so, as a result, uh, was not well thought of by, by Father Conley. Now, incidents were blamed on the Donnellys or their friends. Now, as a result, William Donnelly wrote two letters, one to Father Conley and one later to Bishop Walsh about Father Conley's perception of the Bidolf scene. And in both letters, he asked to discuss with both the priests about the affair. He wanted to talk to the not only the priests, but the people that were accusing him as a family to tell them to their side of the story so that they could at least come to an agreement. He was concerned that something like this would get out of hand and cause all kinds of grief. The priests, unfortunately, felt it was an impertinence by some young fellow to think that they could give advice to the priests. And as a result of the petition, as a result, the Catholic community laid a petition into the county court county council to have James Carroll appointed a county constable to help support the Catholic community. And he immediately laid charges against Tom Donnelly for a robbery from 1878, in which Tom Donnelly had already been acquitted at least two occasions. Now, in eight, September of 1879, the William Thompson, who lived just north of the Donnelly property, was missing his cow. His wife, Mary, remembered hearing a cow bawling in the Donnelly yard and said, that's my cow. And so immediately Thompson thought the Donnellys had taken their cow. Now the Thompsons and the Donnellys did not talk to each other. There was a chivalry involved that the Donnellys held when Mary and uh, William Thompson were married and it was not well done. And uh, unfortunately the Thompsons were very, very offended by it as they should have been and they would not speak with the Donnellys. So they called a meeting of the Vigilance Committee, uh, the Peace Society, uh, and they, a mob of 40 men on the morning of September 3rd, 1879, came and uh, surrounded the Donnelly property and searched it. Now in the process, the Donnellys argued with them and had some verbal interactions, but unfortunately for the Donnellys, they gave unofficial through approval. And in the process, there were counter charges and charges over the fall of 1879 against each other that led to court cases, extra costs, and so on, with no results. But uh, the Donnellys uh, did not win out in that one. So the Peace Society had, had the experience of searching the Donnelly property without permission. Now, in January of 1880, January 15th, 1880, there was a wedding on the Roman line at Robert Keith's. And the Donnelly boys, all of them attended, the ones that were living at home. They all attended. And unfortunately, that night, uh, the Pat Ryder's barn, uh, located down the road from the Donnelly place, was burned. And uh, the only Donnellys that did not have an alibi were Johanna, and his wife, Joe, uh, or his wife, and his uh, and her husband, Jim. They didn't have. They were in. Uh, Johanna was sixty, and Jim was sixty-five, and uh, they didn't have an alibi. So Carol, James Carroll, a special constable, charged them with arson, and this led to the events that we're, we're going to talk about in a few seconds. Sometime in January, between January fifteenth and February second, a matter of two weeks the Catholic settlement of St. Patrick's determined that they were going to get rid of the Donnellys. Now, this might have been exacerbated by, uh, in eight, at the last trial at, uh, for Grant, uh, in Granton, of the Ryder arson case against the Donnellys, 
James Donnelly threatened to sue for persecution against the vigilantes, James Carroll, and anyone else involved over the Ryer arson case. They had no witnesses. The Donnellys had lived on the same road as Pat Ryder for over 30 years. They had no differences ever. They got along fine. They shared property. They had no fences between their properties. So everyone got along. But all of a sudden, on January 15th, the Donnellys apparently saw fit to burn uh, Pat Ryder's barn down. There's some strong indication that the vigilante committee may have had something to do with the actual fire. But during that time, when Donnie threatened that he was going to sue them, that may have led to the, the decision to do something more serious. Now, sometime after this, James Fahili, who was a friend of Tom Donnelly's, was asked by James Carroll to watch the Donnelly homestead on February 3rd, the day before the last trial date in Granton. There were meetings were held at the home of James Tuohy on the Roman line, and the last meeting was held in the barn of Martin McLaughlin in, on February 2nd on the Swamp Line. Now, preparations were made for making clubs from cardwood, cordwood and arranging to bring spades, shovels, and axes, etc., to be used. James Fahili was assured by Jim Carroll and his uncle James Mahard that no harm would come to the Donners, as they were to be taken out of the house hung up until they confessed to the arson case. Then they would be let go. No problems whatsoever. The rendezvous places were established. The first one, the Cedar Swamp Schoolhouse on the Swamp Line, where the vigilantes from the Swamp Line and other eastern lots could assemble, were, was determined. Now, the Cedar Swamp Schoolhouse still stands on Highway 23, now, on your way up to Mitchell. Uh, you will come by it. It's uh, slightly altered. This uh, closed in 1964, and this picture taken in January of 65, it uh, was still in pretty good shape. Uh, it's much more altered now, the, but the cupola is still there, and the, uh, the stone established in 1874 is still there, but the rest has changed quite a bit. But it, the building still stands. Now, um, prep, um, the other place was Pat Ryder's uh, farm. He had a, another farm down the Roman line, down across from the Donnellys, about a kilometer from the Donnellys. And ironically, this was the farm that Patrick Farrell lived on when he was murdered by Jim Donnelly back in 1857. It had been, uh, the, the Farrells lost it, and uh, uh, Ryder purchased the farm. He left the house up, and he used the house when his uh, family came down and farmed the land, the crop, or reaped the crop, or they uh, were plowing the land, they stayed in the house overnight and uh, used it. So it was a meeting place for the vigilantes of the Roman line. And uh, so all the people gathered from the Roman line at this place. Both groups would assemble near midnight on February 4th at Pat Ryder's vacant farmhouse to proceed to the Donnelly place about a kilometer north. <laughs> While the vigilantes assembled, the Donnelly homestead went about its own preparations for the arson trial. First of all, Johnny O'Connor. Now, Johnny O'Connor, I in the book I identified him as being about 12, 11 to 12 years of age. Uh, I've since been told by a genealogist that he was 13.7 uh, years old and uh, that uh, his original name was Jeremiah. I don't know exactly the provenance of that claim, but I'll give that information out to you. He uh, he thought to be was thought to be a little boy at that time, but uh, he was uh, uh, to be at the Donnellys that morning of the February fourth when they went to Granton. He was going to do the chores for them. In the same process, uh, Jim, John Donnelly left the farm on February third and went to Bill Donnelly's house in Wayland's Corners to get the cutter that Bill Donnelly had. They were going to use that to go to the trial in the morning. So Donnelly was going to stay overnight at Will Donnelly's, come back early in the morning, pick up the Johanna and Jim, and go with them to uh, Granton to the trial. Now, unfortunately for the vigilantes, the coming and goings was missed by James Fahili. 
Now, the vigilantes began to assemble in the evening, late evening of February 3rd. They were seen by the Keith family and James Fahili out on the road at night. Pat Ryder was spotted riding a horse south on the Roman line, carrying what the witnesses thought was a gun. The assembly was scheduled for midnight. At each spot, whiskey would have probably been provided, even though Father Connolly was a strong advocate for absence. And before midnight, the Cedar Swamp group began to move towards the Roman line rendezvous as predetermined. On the corner of the swamp line and the Breen side road, which the, the vigilantes were using to get across to the Roman line, John Doherty was a farmer, and he heard the sound of men moving up the road. And he looked out his window and saw a mob of men going down behind on the Breen side road behind his barns. And he feared for his livestock, thinking they were out to harm him, to harm them. So he ran out on the... Uh, roads yelling at them and of course the mob saw him and they started to run away down the road now this is a picture drawn by robert harris of the front of the donnelly property now there you can see in the front in the middle the uh, gate of the donnelly property and beside it is john kane's property uh john kane was a member of the vigilante committee um and uh, the Whalen families lived on the other side of the place. Uh, that night of February 4th, 1880, there were actually uh, three witnesses to the murder uh, behind the gate on Whalen's property. John Whalen was uh, looking out his window at night, saw the murder take place. William Whalen, his brother, and uh, Jim, uh, Will, William Fahili, Jim Fahili's brother, stood behind his gate and watched the murder take place as well. They did not testify in the later on trial. Now, uh, uh, Doherty, on, uh, I have to backtrack a bit, I'm sorry. He recognized seven of the 15 men in the mob now on the side road but he would never discuss it with the authorities it was midnight february 4th 1880 and both groups of vigilantes gathered at pat Ryder's house by 12 30 perhaps having another spot of whiskey for the upcoming activity now while the vigilantes gathered james mahar and carol met with james fahili who had gone into the donnelly house at about 11 o'clock to talk to tom donnelly and left by about 11.30, having determined that Tom Donnelly, Bridget Donnelly, Johanna Donnelly, and James Donnelly, as well as John Donnelly, were in the house. Now, Jim Fahili had been in the kitchen and saw Bridget, Johanna, and Tom, and had heard Jim talking to someone in the front bedroom, who he felt was John Donnelly, his son, not realizing that Johnny O'Connor had come to do the chores and that John Donnelly had left to go to Whalen's Corners. Now, uh, James Carroll then knew that Tom Donnelly would be in his bedroom off the kitchen. Uh, Bridget and Johanna would be in the other bedroom in the front room. And James Donnelly and Johnny O'Connor were in the front bedroom. James Carroll then told James Fahili, go to Whalen's Corners and keep an eye on the Bill Donnelly's house. Jim Fahili then went over to Jack Whalen's house and attended a party with the McLaughlin girls who he walked home about midnight. This must have been after he warned uh, Carol and Mahar. The McLaughlin girls were never called as witnesses at the trial. Now, this is a picture of John uh, Whalen, the site of John Whalen's uh, farm. And uh, this is where the, uh, the Whalen, Jack Whalen watched the uh, murder and William and uh, Feely and William uh, Whalen watched from the gates. Now, um, James Carroll and Jim Mahar then returned to Pat Riders and began to walk with the mob towards the Donny homestead. Being about a kilometer away, it would have been about a 15-minute walk for them to reach. They moved into position around the house, blocking all the exits. Okay. Now, Jim Carroll 
entered the Donnelly house via the kitchen door at the side and went into Tom Donnelly's bedroom and handcuffed him while he was sleeping. This was in pitch black. The disturbance of handcuffing must have awakened, must have awakened Johanna, who was in the bedroom off the kitchen. And she got up, came to the kitchen, and lit a candle. And then she got Bridget to get up and light a fire in the kitchen stove, giving her a knife to cut the kindling. Jim Carroll took the candle and went into the front bedroom where John or James Donnelly and Johnny O'Connor were sleeping. He woke up Donnelly, who got up waking in the process, Johnny O'Connor. Donnelly asked Carroll, what do you got against me? I've got another warrant, he said. Carol stood in the doorway while Donnelly got dressed. Donnelly said, hold the candle so I can see. Donnelly then looked around for his coat. He went out into the kitchen and asked Johanna, where's my coat? And he came back into the bedroom, uh, into the bedroom thinking the coat was there. Then Johnny O'Connor realized that he was using the coat for a pillow. And he gave it to him saying, here it is. Now, Jim Carroll at this time was standing near the doorway, pacing in the front room, whistling. The question is, did he see Johnny O'Connor? John James Donnelly donned his coat and went into the kitchen. And when he got into the kitchen, he saw that Tom Donnelly was handcuffed. And he said, are you handcuffed, Tom? And Tom Donnelly responded, yes, he thinks he's smart. Then Tom demanded, Carol, you read the warrant. And Carol's response was, there's lots of time for that. There was either a hoop or a holler that signaled the mob, who was amounting to about 20 of the men, of, of the 20 of the 36 men, surged into the kitchen door, through the door, and they began to hammer the Donnellys. Now, Jim Donnelly retreated to the north wall between the stove, where he was hammered mercilessly. Johnny O'Connor, when he heard the mob, hid under the bed, under a long, tall laundry basket. And Bridget immediately ran into the front room and up the stairs. Johnny O'Connor, seeing her, ran after her, but ran back to the bedroom under the bed when Bridget got to the top of the stairs and slammed the door in his face. The kitchen resounded with hollering, screaming, and hammering sounds as the mob struck at the three remaining victims. Tom obviously fought back. In the process, he gave James Toohey a black eye before he fought his way out of the kitchen, ran across the front room, and out the front door. Members of the mob followed him out the door. Tom got three meters from the door when the people around the door beat him down. Story is that he was pitchforked in the back because there were three blood spots on the snow that showed where he fell. Johanna, seeing either Tom or Bridget go out to the front room, tried to get out there too. And, but as she got to the threshold of the doorway, James Mahar brained her and she fell at the threshold. Tom's limp body was carried back into the cabin by James Hogan, Pat Quigley, and James Mahar Jr., who threw him down the floor in front of the bedroom door where Johnny O'Connor was hiding. Johnny O'Connor saw John Pertell and Tom Ryder standing by Tom's body. The vigilantes, having finished off the three Donnellys, removed the handcuffs from Tom. Johnny O'Connor could hear the metal clinking sound. And apparently Tom moaned and tried to sit up. And someone cried, bring a light here. Jim Carroll said, hit the son of a bitch on the head and break open his skull. And James Toohey, who had suffered the sore eye from Tom, took Pat Quigley's spade and whacked Tom four times in the skull, knocking him down. Someone asked, where's the girl? Look upstairs. Some of the vigilantes went upstairs, then returned. Someone commented, she's all right. And from the kitchen, someone brought an oil lamp and dumped the contents of, on Tom's bed and John, John, Jim's bed and lit them on fire. A voice said, oh, that won't burn. But someone thought it showed sufficient momentum so that the mob decided to leave the kitchen door. They closed the front door before they left. Everything had gone to plan except one thing, or two things. There was blood on the snow, three hand-sized spots of blood about three paces from the front door, and Johnny O'Connor had been left a witness. The mob then left the Donnelly homestead and headed north to the home of William Donnelly at Williams Corners, where Jim Feely was, Feely was waiting for them to arrive. After the mob left, Johnny O'Connor left by the kitchen to cross the road to talk to Whale or to, 
to the will to go to the will in place. The bodies lay by the front door. Bridget's body was upstairs. Jim Donnelly was down by the uh, the stove. Johanna was in the doorway. In the morning, when the fire had burned them to cinders, Bridget's body lay right beside Tom's, actually on top of Tom's. The wall had the inside wall had burned first. The floor had sloped. Her body rolled down and landed on top of uh, Jim Donnelly's body. So the two bodies actually were lumped together in the in the ghastly ruins in the morning. And this was from the London Advertiser of the time showing the house lot. Number 11 is, is Tom body, Tom's body. 10 is Johanna's body. Eight and nine are uh, Tom's and Bridget's body. Now, at the time, they had different names. They thought, they thought that uh, number 10 was Tom and uh, number 11 was Johanna, but it wasn't. It, it turned out the other way around. Now, it was about, a, this is a picture that Robert Harris did of the Donnelly Farm. It was based on a sketch because Tom, William Thompson's house looked exactly the same as the Donnelly house. And so he used that as a sketch. There's some indication that actually the Donnelly house was a framed log cabin. It actually had a frame uh, siding to it. The house to the uh, to the side is the uh, milk house, and it burned in the fire. And this is a souvenir card that we printed up showing the Donnelly homestead. This is from the London Free Press version of the house. And uh, you can see James Donnelly's picture. He died in 1877. Robert Donnelly was uh, just come home from prison and was visiting his sister in, uh, in St. Thomas and Johanna and Jim. And this is a sketch of the murder scene from Robert Harris. You can see the schoolhouse. You can see the Donnelly house that would have been burned. The cane spelled wrong, and across from the road were the Whalens and the, the Pat Whalen on the left, John John Whalen on the right, and uh, that was the Roman line. And this is the map of the vigilantes took. Uh, they went from uh, James Harrigan's uh, the school up the road Roman line up to the Donnelly place, then headed on to uh, Whalen's Corner, which was marked with a red triangle. And this is uh, the square. It took about an hour from the walk from uh, the Donnelly homestead to William Donnelly's house at Wayland's Corners. William Donnelly's house was located at the con off the concession road, crowded between Walker's house, a blacksmith shop, and Ben Blackwell's house you know, on the west side of the road. All the buildings were less than 15 meters apart. Now, this is a picture taken in 1880 of uh, Bill Donnelly's house. It burned in 1886 by arson. Someone burned it down, but it stood for six years. In the picture, you can see on the right, there is someone posing with a shotgun aiming at the door. This is supposedly where the, the gunman waited the night of the murder. We don't know for sure. Uh, Jim Fahili, who had been spying on Whalen's uh, corner's house since about one o'clock, reported to Jim Carroll that the mob and the mob that the house contained William Donnelly, his wife Nora, John Donnelly, and my neighbor Martin Hogan. The mob uh, surrounded the properties, including the other residents, to prevent any interference. It was now about two o'clock in the morning. Now, number four bedroom, five was the bedroom that Jan John Donnelly and Martin Hogan shared. Number two was William Donnelly's bedroom. The bed is number three. Yeah, Nora and Bill were in that one. And uh, the kitchen door is number six. And the kitchen is number one. And uh, number seven is a woodshed. And number eight is a workshop. And the, the house had was very convoluted. John had to uh, go into Bill's room to get out into the kitchen. So this is what we're looking at at the night of the, the murder. Uh, since the house contained the sister of John Kennedy, one of the vigilantes, Nora was uh, her brother, the process would have to be more selective. No harm was intended for Nora Donnelly. It was intent to kill William Donnelly only. The outbuilding premises were searched, but none of the horses found in the stables were harmed. The mob by now was quite reduced in numbers. 
And at 2.20, the vigilantes had their positions around the house, avoiding the kitchen window opposite the door. Two shooters were in position on the edge of the small porch, ready whenever the door was open. Two men, probably Martin McLaughlin, who had a, uh, a repeating rifle, and a rider who became known as Shotgun Rider, uh, had a loaded shotgun. They started to yell, fire, fire, open the door, Will. And they must have hollered two or three times. John Donnelly heard it, got up, and because uh, he was sleeping off of Will's room, went through Will's room and said, I wonder who's hollering about uh, the fire. Someone's rapping on the door. Will woke up, and Martin Hogan woke up as well and followed John, but he stayed in the doorway. He didn't go out into the kitchen. John went into the kitchen and exclaimed, I wonder who's opening or hollering. And he opened the door, outside kitchen door, and immediately there were two instantaneous gunshots, which struck him, driving him back two meters into the door jam of William's doorway. John, John supposedly uttered, Will, Will, I'm shot, and may the Lord have mercy on my soul. One suspects that perhaps he didn't have time to do even that. The reaction to this was quick, as Martin Hogan in the doorway of the bedroom warned Will Donnelly to be quiet. It was him they wanted to shoot. And Hogan warned Donnelly, if you don't make any noise, they will come and kill us all. And supposedly, Will Donnelly lifted up the curtain of the window beside his bed and saw James Carroll, John Kennedy, and James Ryder Jr. standing by his bedroom window. He saw three others by the road, but he was not certain of their identity. Now, this is a picture of the shotgun wad that was recorded. It was from the Catholic Record, a newspaper published in London, December 26, 1879, almost hot off the press, actually. And it was uh, pieced together by Bill Donnelly after the, the murder. This was found in the kitchen floor beside John Donnelly's body. And then you can see the trial uh, evidence has been recorded on the top of it. It was pasted together and used in trial, in the trial. Um, this is a picture of John Donnelly in the casket. The only picture we know of that was ever taken of John Donnelly. Uh, the other picture is a sketch of him from the London Advertiser. And it's not a particularly flattering one. This probably isn't a very good one either, but it's uh, a picture. He had long hair, a mustache, and uh, he had 29 bullet holes in his chest and one through his groin. And any one of those would have killed him. Uh, when they found that they had shot Bill Donnelly, they thought they had shot Bill Donnelly, they fired off six to seven shots to celebrate. And uh, John Donnelly said, ah, brother-in-law is easy at last. And then Carol said, what next? William Donnelly could hear the others talking, but could not make out what they were saying. Nora Rose got out of bed, said she, I'm going to get John, even though they might shoot me. She then attempted to pull his body into the bedroom, and Martin Hogan helped her. John was pulled into the bedroom and bled to death within five minutes. Martin Hogan hid under William Donnelly's bed, shaking uncontrollably. Nora got the fire going in the bedroom, and the three hunkered down for a long wait for daylight. Unknown to William Donnelly and the others, the vigilantes began to walk towards James Keefe's Jr.'s house in Usburn Township, just up the road, to pay him a visit as well. Keith was one of the friends of the Donnellys and was considered part of the Donnelly gang. Uh, Jim Fihili, who later claimed he knew nothing about the intent to kill the Donnellys that night until the gunshot, said to the mob, boys, you won't do it. You've done enough tonight. And with that, the mob dispersed and the night of murder was over. The murders shocked the province and the nation. A fit of sympathy the, at first, sympathy was with the victims and their surviving members. But soon one-sided stories of the exploits of the Donnies were captured by the newspaper. The entire township of Badolf went into a state of silence and what one of the prosecution lawyers called disremembering. They shut up. They wouldn't say a thing. And eventually, uh, it was shown by a number of incidents in and around Lucan and Badolf the Crown realized that they would not get a fair trial in London, and they moved to have a change of venue. Now, a number of tiny conflicts developed. 
in between the vigilantes, the community, the Donleys in the community, the Crown and the O'Connor family, the Crown and the Bedal community, and most importantly, the Crown and the government of, of Oliver Mowat. The venue was denied and the trial was set for the fall of 1880. The police gathering of evidence was sporadic at best. William Donnelly was the most successful investigator. In fact, the names that we have now for these people, the ones who, who hit Johanna, who killed Tom and carried his body in, they came from the research of Will Donnelly. Individuals did their very best to derail the prosecution and the Crown. And the police spent valuable time chasing false leads. Bloody shirts planted in Florence, bloody shirts and, and clothing in manure piles, they tried to lead uh, people away from others. And uh, as a result, a lot of valuable time and assets were la wasted. The drama of the Donnelly murders drew a vast readership for the local newspapers. Six men were arrested, and uh, James Carroll alone stood trial for the murder of Johanna Donnelly. The first trial ended with a uh, hung jury. And this is the courtroom that, that the trial was held. It's uh, the, the now, what is the, uh, I believe still is, the Middlesex County Council quarters. It's now the county building. It's been sold, and in three or four years will be uh, taken over by a private enters, enterprise. Uh, but it uh, was as it is right then. It's uh, the seats. You can see the prisoner's dock right in front. And that's where James Carroll sat. Uh, the second trial, the first trial ended in a hung jury. The second trial showed definite evidence of political interference by the government. Moet feared that his government would be seen as being anti-Irish Catholic. And so as a result, did a number of things to try to get the trial over with. He wanted it done. Uh, and as a result, the second trial ended with an acquittal of James Carroll. Now, cracks began to show in the wall established by the Vigilante Committee. James Fahili and William Fahili both confessed to what they knew about the murder. They said they knew who were there, they could tell, and they were going to tell all because they felt that the vigilantes had reneged on some of their promises to them. They were arrested and ex extradited from the United States. There was great hope for justice, in the, and the Crown was excited. They finally could get Carol and all of them put to, to, uh, to trial, and justice would be served. But it was totally bulldozed by Oliver Mullen. When the Fahilis applied for bail, the Crown, of course, determined they weren't going to give bail and argued against it. But despite that, without consulting the Crown, Mowat gave the Fahili brothers bail. And they immediately took off back to the United States. All hope for justice was denied. And thank you. And I'd like to thank Brad and my daughter, Paula uh, Dibbets, for all the work they've done on this uh, presentation. Uh, I couldn't have done it without them. And thank you very much. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, fascinating topic, and of, of course, one that um, you're not the only one that's been enthralled with in, in southwestern Ontario. This is, this is one that um, lots of us growing up in in London and, and this sort of region, it's 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 sort of become part of our upbringing um, as as young historians in this region. Um, so I'd like to remind everybody in our audience that there is a bit of a delay uh, between what we're seeing here uh, in the in the studio, if you will, and what's happening on on YouTube. So if um, you're posting questions and I'm I'm not getting to them um, in a quick enough manner, that's um, that's that's part of the reason but we'll do our best to answer all your questions um and so if you do have any i i haven't seen very many pop up yet but if you do have any questions for glenn please put them in the chat and uh and we'll bring them forward in, in a little bit 
Um, so Glenn, I would like to start with, um, um, you know, I'm not sure I would call it the most, the most obvious question, but um, when I say that we grew up with um, sort of this, this version of the Donnelly's, um, I would say it was a very one-sided history that we grew up with in London. It, it was, it was always, um, it was always the story of the Black Donnellys, right? It was always the story of these awful, you know, horse dealers, and and it, it was always the story of the, um, you know, the stagecoach lines and how they were constantly, uh, you know, troublemakers and, and burning barns and all that this sort of thing. Was this really difficult for you to? to sort of overcome? Was there really a pile of evidence that you had to fight your way through to sort of get towards the, the truth of what these Donnelly boys were actually like? Well, I think, I think the fact that to paint them all as uh, the same is wrong. Uh, the one thing one has to realize, they were an Irish family, Irish Catholic family. They were used to supporting each other and I draw that out rightly or wrongly, they supported each other. Uh, if they were in trouble with the law, they supported them. Even though they might know that the, the, the guy did the crime, they would try and be supportive of them. And uh, not all the Donnellys were bad. Uh, in fact, you can look at, I would say, maybe three, two or three of the Donnelly boys of the seven were probably responsible for most of the problems. Uh, one of them was Tom Donnelly, the youngest. Uh, Bob Donnelly had some issues mentally. Uh, there's some strong indication he might have been a bit of an arsonist. Um, James Jr. was definitely a bully, definitely a troublemaker, but he was also problemed with alcohol. And he uh, was noted when he was drunk, he got himself into some issues. Uh, Bill Donnelly was a bright, bright guy and uh, was uh, astute. And if he got into trouble, he he knew how to get out of it. And in fact, the story told that he was one of the ones sentenced in 1876 to three months prison. He got out because he became almost terminally ill. And the story is that he swallowed a bar of soap and took ill, and as a result, they pardoned him and allowed him to go home. And he, he miraculously, instead of dying, got well again. And uh, so he was always able to use the law and very bright and challenging people. So, he, you know, he was a good guy that way. And uh, remarkable, remarkable personalities. They were very flamboyant. Most of the, Don, the, the Irish Catholic community were hardworking uh, nose to the ground um, workers and were not intellectuals. Uh, the Donnelly seemed to be a little bit of that. I think Johanna herself wanted education and saw the value of education. And uh, of all the Donnellys that were been painted badly, she's the one that's probably the most vi uh, most uh, harmed. She did, there's no evidence of her being a she-devil. So there's no evidence of her wishing her boys to kill the man like their dad had done so she could call them the, her son. She never did that. She quilted. She, she was involved with the church. She was on first name basis with Father Conley even. And they got along well with all the other priests. Um, Jim was a little different. Jim a Sr. He was a... An Irish, but he minded after he got out of prison, he did not get involved at all. Other, He was a road, he maintained the road, and he did his farm work. And he not involved in any crimes at all. Uh, so it was the boys that did the actual, some of them. And Tom and Bob and James Jr. were the three that were the most active. Pat Donnie moved away and was never around uh, Lucan at the time. He got arrested a couple of times because he was there, but but it just happened to be visiting. And uh, so, no, I, I think there were some of them that were all on the road. But there were other part people in Bidolf that were doing criminal actions as well. Pat Riders was guilty of the murder of Brimacombe. So was William Casey. James Carroll um, 
no crimes, but uh, he certainly was, uh, someone called him a, a psychopath because he didn't seem to have any sense of guilt. <clears throat> I don't know if I've answered your question. hope I did. <laughs> it's it's a balance, like, like everything in history, right? We see we see this version where they're painted one way, and and it feels like you're just trying to bring it back towards sort of a, a more neutral. Where yeah, there are some, there were certainly some sons that were bad, and um, they did some bad things, but it wasn't sort of universally these awful, awful people. No, you couldn't say. paint them all. Like <clears throat> the term "Black Donnelly," of course, be was a moniker that Thomas Kelly. And Thomas Kelly was a consummate novel writer, uh, absolute wonderful boy of expressions. Historically, totally inaccurate. If he didn't have a fact, he made it up and uh, never let truth get in the way of uh, a good story. Uh, Tom, uh, Orlo Miller uh, had an uphill battle. He had to make an impression on the public that the Donnellys weren't as bad. So he went the other extreme. He... He justified it through an Irish feud. And I, I think the, the Irish characteristics of doing things like uh, you, if you're doing a murder, you do it in mass numbers so that the, the crown, the, the authorities can't arrest everybody. And uh, if you remember correctly, uh, there were 36 at least involved in the murder. Only six were arrested. So that meant there was 30 of them still out in the neighborhood. And so anyone speaking about the Donleys didn't want to offend the 30 of their neighbors who were still actively uh, around. So the friends of the Donleys kept very quiet during the uh, the investigation. No one said anything. As I said, they became a, disremembered anything. And uh, that was the thing. They thought, we don't have to help the authority. You didn't help the authorities. If you're Irish at that time, the authorities were the enemy. And uh, you closed uh, family ties and you stuck together. Um, I don't know where that went, but that, that's my answer. Um, so sort of following up on that, uh, and Catherine uh, says something very similar. Um, she remembers reading it, and, and I do as well, um, books uh, when we're a lot younger that um, sort of have different details on on the actual night of the murder and did you find a lot of discrepancies in sort of the older books um on sort yeah of the, 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 uh, the, the stuff i used for the murder basically came from the trial testimony of johnny o'connor william donnelly's testimony martin hogan's testimony nora donnelly's testimony and the admissions of jim james fiat Fahili and uh, William Fahili. And uh, John Doherty talked to his brother in law. He was the only one he talked, that's the only person he talked to about what he saw the night of the February 4th. And he gave the seven names to his brother in law. He would not talk to the authorities, even though Bill Donnelly tried to get him to talk. James Keefe went to talk. The police went to talk. Of course, the police went. That was like slamming the door in their face because the, 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 the police just basically became persona non grata in Luke and in Bedolf. They just had nothing to do with the police at all. And uh, the police were just shot right out. So, so yeah, it was based on, it's based on, uh, yeah, but like we, the, Bill Donnelly did an awful pile of research. And Donnelly, he had vested interests. He wanted justice, of course, and he he want, he also came up with a myth that um, every vigilante died a violent death, and uh, and that <clears throat> that's pushing the envelope. Uh, the McGrath family on Christmas Eve of eighteen eighty, the McGrath family, their suspicion that Mag the McGrath, some of the McGraths were involved with the murder, um, but they were killed in a sleigh ride. Uh, outside of uh, uh, the Clandeboy, uh, a train hit them, so, so, uh, killed four or five of them, I can't remember which, and then only a little baby survived. Uh, and uh, that started the le legend that they all died violent deaths. And of course, Bill Donnelly built on that. And then Bob Donnelly, in his, uh, his own, own way, uh, Bob had some real serious uh emotional problems later he began, suffered from depression and did a couple of stints at the asylum the insane asylum and uh 
died. The, none of the Donnellys lived. Uh, I think Pat was the oldest. He had been the one that most isolated from him. He lived to be 65. Uh, Bill Donnelly died at the age of 52. I believe uh, uh, Bob Donnelly died in 1911. I, he'd be probably close to maybe 60 at the oldest. And, of course, the others died earlier. Um, Jenny Donnelly died of tuberculosis in 1916. She was the actual longest surviving Donnelly. She was also the youngest. But she died of tuberculosis at the age of 58. Now, she had 10 children. And they lived very well in Lucan or in Glencoe, and uh, descendants of them still exist in the area. And uh, uh, Bill Donnelly's uh, had three children. The uh, son Jack never married, never had any children, or he did marry, but he didn't have any children. And Nora and uh, Joanne, I believe Joanne married, but I don't think she had any children. But Nora had children, and her their descendants live in, in southwest Ontario now. And uh, Pat Donnie married a second time. His first wife died of uh, childbirth and his loss as well as the baby as well. He remarried and had three children, and they have descendants in, in the Thorold uh, St. Catherine's area. And that's it. There's no no name of Donnelly left from the actual family. So. Well, there you go. So, uh, Rob, that answers your question as well. He was asking about Donnelly family members in, in the area. So, um, yeah, they're very, uh, the, uh, I talked to one of the great grandsons of Bill Donnelly, and I asked him, uh, what did he know about the Donnellys? And he said, I was 20 years old and I was going through my grandmother, Nora, Nora Lord's uh, dresser. And came across two books, the uh, Black Donnellys and the Donnellys Must Die. And that was the first time he knew anything. He said, well, what, what are these, about, Grandma? And he said, uh, those, those are the history of our family. And that was the first thing he knew that he was even connected to the Donnellys. And he was 20. And he taught school in Ontario for uh, for the rest of his uh, career. So, and yet he had never heard about that at all. So. He's now a very strong advocate for the family and uh, family rights and, and and has looked after things in uh, in uh, Lucan with the uh, museum. So he's a, a leadership role. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, you were speaking of ages. If we could jump back, I, I remember I had, I had a question while you were talking about um, when um, James was in prison for the murder for seven years. Um, and of course, Joanna was raising those um, all the children on her own. Can you give us a rough idea of the of the ages of the boys um, while he was in prison? Were James they old enough been, to help in him? In eighteen fifty seven, James would have been. Uh, I'm trying to. Think, I think he would be about eleven or twelve. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Bill Donnie's the next oldest. Was born in eighteen forty five, I believe. And he, uh, I'm not a genealogist, so, the, you know, I'm flushy on dates. But, uh, he, so he would have been, uh, what's that mean? Uh, him, well, no, pardon me. James would have been older, uh, 1841. Uh, he'd been 15, 16. Uh, Bill would have been uh, three years younger. He'd been, uh, what, 12? 12. So they would have helped with the farm. Uh, so there's no question about that. The others were... Uh, every year afterwards, uh, like Pat would have been uh, probably 11, uh, John would have been uh, 10, uh, and uh, Tom, Tom would, or Bob was a year older than Tom, so Tom was in uh, 1854, so he'd been only, he'd been uh, three years old, so they would have been pretty useless, and Jenny would have been a year or two years old, so for the eight years, she would have had some help. Now, there's a story told that James Donnelly Jr., Sr.'s brother, came with them, came out and helped Johanna for a while. But it's very difficult to trace that. There was a James, there was a John Donnelly in the area, and uh, his brother, other brother was Pat Donnelly. And there is a story told about it, but that there's very fleeting. And if he was there, he wasn't there for a long time. And he actually be, was, there was a John Donnelly who was arrested and spent three years in prison, about the same time that Jim Donnelly did too. So whether he was a brother or not, I don't know. And I'm, I'm quite frankly, I had enough on my plate not to worry about him. So. <laughs> 
Um, so just um, just before I turn it back over to Tom, um, I wanted to point out that somebody, uh, uh, I'm going to get the name wrong, um, but um, Jules has said that uh, is descended from um, the <laughs> Bill Argy, but uh, pronounced Michael Hargy. Um, Michael Hargy. Um, so uh, a descendant there watching. So um, that's a nice Michael Hargy. As well. Yes. Oh yeah. Well, Michael Hargies were fr basically friendly to the Donwicks. Uh, Michael Patrick Michael Hargy was a justice of the peace, and if the Donwicks wanted uh, to lay charges, they went to him <laughs> to lay charges because he would be more friendly to their uh, their complaints than anyone else. And uh, the vigilantes or the enemies of the Donnies used the Stanley brothers because the Stanleys hated the Donnies for whatever reason. And so it, it was very, well, very political. In fact, in the book, I talk about the effectiveness of the law enforcement and, and, and so on. And uh, Charles Hutchison, the crown attorney for Middlesex, was constantly, constantly writing letters to the Justice of the Peace, giving him don't do this, don't do that, you can't do that, you can't do this. And uh, like he was, they were just inept often. And so were the constables, like the county constable, uh, well, they got, well, imagine William Casey was uh, accused of a murder and became a justice of the peace. Like that's, uh, that's not like having Donald Trump as president. <laughs> on, on that note, I'm going to say uh, thank you so much, Glenn. I mean, uh, as I say, this is um, a part of the history that that I grew up with and, and a fascinating part of sort of London lore and London history. But I hope you're really bringing this to um, a wider audience. There's a lot of people here on our um, watching today that that may have had no idea of the Donnelly. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, and I'm going to turn it back over to Tom now. Uh, Tom, I can't hear you. Sorry. So um, Tom was having some tech issues a little bit earlier. He's, I think he said uh, something flickered and um, his computer got reset. So um, perhaps it's just on my end. Um, Glenn, can can you hear Tom at all? No, we can't hear him. Okay, well, well maybe I will just uh, take this opportunity to close out on his behalf, though. Um, so I will say thank you, everybody, for joining us again. Um, a lot of um, a lot of uh, common names that we see every every month. So thank you so much for joining us again. Um, I hope you enjoyed um, Tom's. Uh, sorry, I hope you enjoyed Glenn's talk. And of course, uh, I did see a few people um, mentioning that they were interested in buying Glenn's new new book. So um, you saw Glenn's email there at the end. We will also put it in the description of the video. Um, so if you'd like to get a hold of Glenn, um, please feel free to send him an email. And also, um, Glenn will be at our annual conference in February. So if you'd like to talk to him then or pick up a book um, or maybe arrange for him to take you on a driving tour of Southwestern Ontario, he he loves that. He's he's always happy to to drive people to Lucan's. So um, we will say thank you so much for joining us, and thank you, Glenn. This was fascinating, and I hope everybody has a wonderful afternoon.